have um, had a break in transmission because of network issues. I'm so sorry about that. So Mrs. Agbo has vast experience in complex, sensitive and commercial disputes ab across a broad range of sectors. And she has written and presented locally and internationally several legal articles on maritime law and arbitration. She's a founding trustee of the Children Arise Foundation, and she's the chair of the Maritime Committee of the Section on Business Law of the Nigerian Bar Association. She's a member of, Arbit of the Arbitration and Maritime Committees of the International Bar Association, and she's a member of the Institute of Construction Industry Arbitrators. She's also a member of the International Chamber of Commerce Nigeria Commission. Mrs. Agbo has been recognized by several leading international organizations over all her three or four decades of practice. But just so that we will summarize a bit, we've picked a few of the more recent ones. And in 2020 and 2021, she was listed in the Legal 500 Hall of Fame in the shipping and transport category. She's a chambers, she was also recognized as an expert in arbitration in the Chamber's Global Review in 2021. And she was recognized as a global leader in transportation in the shipping category by Who's Who Legal Nigeria in 2020. Mrs. Agbo is an astute and highly accomplished lawyer and businesswoman. She's a compassionate role model and mentor. I should know about that. And she's a dynamic leader with high achievement motivation. Thank you so much for joining us, madam. It's a pleasure to have you here. We didn't hear you. Antifuke, can you unmute? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Thank, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we have my own brother, Femi Akinsunde, fellow of the Nigerian Society of Engineers. Is currently the group CEO of the Alpha Mid Group, AMG. AMG is the first facility management company in Nigeria to be certified to ISO 9001 2015 facility management. AMG is also accredited by the UK Accreditation Service and also accredited by the American National Standards Institute. So Femi holds a BSc in Industrial Engineering from University of Ibadan, Nigeria, Nigeria's premier university, and a master's in engineering management from University of Port Harcourt. Prior to forming the AMG, the Alphamid Group, he worked, in, he worked in many Fortune 500 companies, notably Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria, UBA United Bank of Africa, Nestle, and he has a wide industry experience in manufacturing, oil and gas, banking, real estate, and infrastructure services. He's also been recognized nationally international, and internationally. In 2021, he was named the Real Estate Personality of the Year by the Nigeria Institution of Estate Surveyors and Valuers. In 2018, his company was recognized as a company to aspire Africa was, was given the Company to Aspire Africa Award by the London Stock Exchange Group. And in 2018 also, he won or was listed as top 25 CEOs in the next Bull Award Awards by the Nigerian Stock Exchange and Business Day. Actually, he won that award. And in 2018 as well, he was listed as one of the 70 worthy ambassadors by Nigeria's own premier university on the 70th anniversary of the University of Ibadan. In 2013, Femi was named as the Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year for West Africa in, emerging, in the emerging category. So what I love about Femi is that he's a visionary. At a time when we were all colleagues in Shell and you know, growing our careers in Shell, he realized that what he wanted for his life, he couldn't get as a paid employer, employee. So he left a boarding illustrious career into the land of the unknown to start his alpha mid, 
And I'm so proud of what he's been able to achieve over the last couple of decades. Femi, you're so welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And then we have Tolu Dima Okoje. She's the managing partner of Kola Akomolidi and Company. It's a real estate or uh, estate valuing, valuation company. And she has created something really unique. This money behavior quotient. I'd like her to talk about it at some point, which is a tool for assessing how your lifestyle is hindering you or helping you to build wealth. She is Nigeria's money behavior strategist. That is the only one that I know. And she's a certified financial education instructor. She's the founder of the Money Map Academy, which is a finance literacy organization. And she's the co-founder of the Nest Egg Financial Planning and Consultation Consultants Limited. She works with organizations to train their teams on how to implement life-changing money strategies that will ultimately increase productivity. She's a writer. She's the author of a book called 21 Steps to Move from Broke to More Than Enough. Tony is a registered real estate surveyor and valuer. And she's a member of the Personal Finance Society and a member of the Chartered Insurance Institute of the United Kingdom. So this is one person we need to watch very closely because she's going places. And I'm so happy that we have this dynamic young woman as part of the panelists for this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tulu. Now, bringing up the rear beautifully is our own managing partner, Emo Kinyovo Dafi Akpede, the managing partner of Compost Mentis Legal Practitioners. She has a master's from Oxford University in the United Kingdom, as well as a BA in, in jurisprudence from the same university. Prior to that, she earned a Bachelor's of Science in Economics and Management from Bristol University in the United Kingdom. She's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK, and she holds a diploma in International <coughs> Commercial Arbitration, which is the highest academic qualification at the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. She's a U United Kingdom qualified solicitor, and she's a member of the Chartered Institute of Trademark Attorneys in the United Kingdom. She's currently undergoing a program in um, the Uni University of Southern California in the USA, which will lead to her LLM in with Entertainment Law Certificate. She's a member of the Future of Legal Practice Committee of the Nigerian Bar Association. She's a director of a few companies listed there, Realty International, which is a, a, an international real estate company, Perfectus Bondi, which is a fabric care company in Nigeria. She's a trustee of Compost Mentis Foundation, an NGO set up by our founder, Dafi Akpede SAM. And recently, she's been called to be, and has accepted to be a director in RR Solutions Technology, which is an IT solutions company. So Emma Kinyovo is our, my boss at this point in time, and I'm so happy that she's on this panel to share her knowledge on topic at, at hand. Thank you for joining us, Emma Kinyovo. Thank you, CEO. And she has said it. Thank you very much, my God. My name is Noli Akpedeye and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Compost Mentis Legal Practitioners. I'll now hand over the virtual stage to my colleague, Mr. Duke Wosu, who will commence the webinar in chief. Before I do that, let me introduce Duke formally. So Duke is a member of the, the team in Compost Mentis Legal Practitioners. He's our team lead of the medical practice, medical law practice, as well as being an associate in the firm. Before he studied law, he, he was a registered nurse. He actually worked as a nurse, a midwife, and a public health expert. He's a, he's a certified next generation chartered secretary and administrator by the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria. He's a certified copyright lawyer. He went through a program from, of Harvard University Copyright X program. 
He has a specialty in US medical law and health ethics from the University of Pennsylvania in the United States of America. He's a member of the Nigerian Bar Association and a member of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. Duke is a chartered registrar of the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators and the Abuja Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He's a director, a non-executive director of EDE, APP Online Services Limited and Ritik Hospitals, Pharmacies and Sundries. Duke is an avid motivator of Nigerian law students who've seen it in action and actually was awarded by his um, alma mater, Motivator of Nigerian Students Award from the Namdi Azikiwe University in Oka. Thank you so much, Duke. I hand over the stage and the microphone to you at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Operating Officer. And good morning to our panelists. We well, thank you so much for agreeing to be here. It's an honor, and we really, really appreciate that. And viewers, good morning to you all. We will begin with uh, the Leonard Silk. The Leonard Silk, Mrs. Funke, Funke Abo SN. Please tell us the corporate nature of the law firm that you manage, its characteristics, and why it is suitable, most importantly, why it is suitable for the purpose of your practice matter. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, let me first of all start by thanking Compos Mentis for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, I want to actually say that um, listening to the, my colleagues on the panel, first of all, I think I'm part of the dinosaur in the room, one. Two, this is the time of, you know, youth vigor and so much going on in the in the world and in the invest in the business world i'm really really excited to be sharing the same panel uh, as um, tolu and mr olufemi akin today i've heard of alpha meet i know that you guys are going places so well done congratulations and um uh, maybe we'll talk again soon after and um, tolu i really like what i heard about what you do and who you are. And so that's really exciting. Um, so um, in fact, and of course, Emma, I know well, so I know that she's going places certainly with her pedigree. Um, and I, I also think that um, I am going to be learning from you guys because the structure that we have as a law firm is the oldest one ever in the world. Everybody does that. So I'm going to be learning from you guys. I'm hoping to take something back to my um, firm, especially for the young ones, because they are coming up with all these ideas. I am really the dinosaur in the room because I probably be retiring in a couple of years from now. So I'm going to be listening really very closely to what you're going to say. So you can take what I say. I, it might be helpful, it might be not, but um, I hope it brings some value in terms of you know one's experience in with that kind of structure that we have and uh, the law firm of Denton Decker's law started life as Adepetun Kaksi Martins Agwa and Shredum and it actually started life as Adepetun and Caxton Martins in the same spirit as when Daphne started his own sole proprietorship many years ago and Adepetun and, uh, and Caxton Martins the full names are Afolabi Caxton Martins and Shola Adikbetun. Shola Adikbetun started this whole thing as he was a sole proprietor, he was a sole practitioner. And he joined with Falabi, who was working in one of the earliest commercial law firms in Nigeria back in 1991. So that's how they started. I worked with a sole proprietor, Mr. Fola Shashibu. Um, I started work there from 1985 up to 1993, when I then joined what was then known as Adepetun and Caxon Martins, and it became Adepetun, Caxon Martins, and Agua. And obviously, we had a number of lawyers working with us, one of whom is a managing partner today. She became a partner, I think, in 2005. Um, and so we became Adepetun, Caxon Martins, Agua, and Shogun. So that was Kemi Shogun. She joined us in 2005. 
she joined as a partner. She actually started work before me in the partnership at the time, but she came in as an associate. So basically you can see the structure as it came along. Now, in terms of, uh, so it's a partnership and um, the issue of what kind of business you should have, um, especially with law firms, because I think um, on the panel here, apart from Emo, I'm the only other lawyer with a law firm here. And so traditionally, lawyers were either sole practitioners, and then in the 80s, we started having businesses combining or people combining to form partnerships, and those partnerships are called firms. And those firms are not really, you know, what, what, what we are regulated by is the Legal Practitioners um, uh, Act as such and not by any kind of formal regulatory body, although we have, we, 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 we sort of regulate ourselves, so to speak, in within the context of the law. But for partnerships, the law that applies to partnership is called the Partnership Act, but it's a very old act, what we call, based on the statutes of the general application, laws that came, that are in existence before 1900, before we became uh, a, a republic or became, um, a country, a sovereign state, so to speak. And so um, it's a very old law and basically nobody really, you, you just register in the CAC and then there you are, you've got uh, it, it, people coming together as a firm or as a partnership. And um, so there's no LLP, there's no LLD or anything. It was only, I think it was 2011 that Lagos State created the and limited partnerships, which, call, which is called LP. And so some sole proprietors change their um, practices to limited partnerships so that maybe if they had somebody else, then the liability would not be joint as it is now. So for people who come together as individuals um, to form, to start a business, whether it's a law firm, whether it's an accountancy, whether it's um, real estate, because those are the sort of people who do those sort of, have those sort of arrangements, it will be um, a firm of people coming together. And the partnership means that you make money together, you share profits and you share the liabilities fully. So each person is liable to each other. So we are our own checks and balances. So if there's anything, if we employ someone and that person is acting in our name, he binds us with whatever he, he has done. So if there's any liability that comes out as a result of that, then we, the partners, are directly liable. And so we, we are liable personally, even our, if we pass on, if we die, our estates will be liable, will be obliged to pay up those debts that have been owed as a result of something that we did. So you live and die with yourselves. That's really what a partnership is all about. And if you, um, if somebody dies, as a member, as a partner, or, or oh, no. the, the partnership is dissolved, and a new partnership is formed automatically. That's how it happens. So, in terms of um, what, whether um, what we have suits us, that was what existed at the time. There was no innovation as to what what sort of other arrangements you could have as such as legal practitioners. So either you acted as yourself, Funkiago and Co. You don't even have to register. You can carry on business as a sole practitioner in that way. Or you join with other people and then you call yourself some kind of name. Later on, you can start seeing people not using their own names, having foundation, chambers, um, Smith and Jones, Peter and James, all sorts of uh, concoctions and all of that. So, and, and that one enables people to join in the partnership and that you know the, the, the owners of the business are not necessarily out there as being obviously the owners of the business. So we are built along traditional lines. That's what I like, what I'm basically saying. And, um, that, and, and so the vision would be together you now decide what is it you want to do? What's your target? What is your objective as a group, as a firm? What is it you want? What are you trying to build? But in those days, this is the 80s, we had a vision, but you know, it was not really targeted. So, you know, we knew that we we're bringing different strengths and skills into it. And th that's really what people do. So that hasn't changed. That's fundamentally what you do in any kind of business. If you're joining together with other people, you're going to bring people with different skill sets, 
So if you're strong in a particular for law, for, for law practice, there are different parts of the industry that you begin to work in, banking, online gas, shipping, um, general corporate commercial, criminal law, you know. So you bring people with those strengths in to drive your vision forward. So we, for instance, we began to have a vision when we started building, having more people working with us, and we decided that we needed to target ourselves. What do we want to be? Do we want to be the foremost law firm? Do we want to be the foremost law firm in oil and gas? Do we want to be the foremost law firm in this? Or do we just want to be the foremost law firm in everything? So we have to decide. Anybody starting a business has to decide what it is they want to do. We look at your strengths, look at your weaknesses. If you think you want to get to a certain stage, then you need to look at what you need to do to fill the gaps that you have going forward. I don't know if I've answered all of your questions, but I, I don't want to take, I, I don't know how much time I have to say anything more. Is, I, I want to be direct me. If I've gone off point, please do. This is what happens when we have dinosaurs on the, on the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernard Silk. Thank you so, so much. You've just answered the question, you've also brought the modeling aspect. You rightly mentioned that you are the dinosaur in you. And so we really thank you for your modeling advice too. And then I will quickly run down to, to Tolu Dima Okoje. Dima Okoje. Yes, correct. So please, why should people register their businesses? Awesome. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hello. I'm excited to be here. Um, and it's such an honor to be with such notable people on the same platform. It's an honor for me. So to your question, my moderator. Um, so using myself and our businesses as a journey, when we first wanted to start off the financial literacy organization and the um, planning organization, it became a question of what should we do? And we had to consult our lawyers because we had to understand the place of liability, why we needed to do it. And um, one of the key things were one, you want to present your business as a serious entity. So we began to see that when you present yourself as just Tolu, yes, especially in the professional setting, um, just like um, Auntie Funke Ogboa said, um, in real estate profession, because that's a different um, real estate family business, um, we saw that what was guiding us then was use your name, your integrity, the integrity of your personal brand, because and your liabilities are attached to your person. Right, so that was pretty much set up already. That was the originating thought. Even we are evolving from that. Um, and I'm glad to hear some of the conversation that has gone on earlier. But for the other businesses, it became a case of what are the regulations, which one is the most preferred? And we needed to consult with our lawyers. Okay, what do we need to do concerning this? So I began to see that when I wanted to, I was training with my mentor for multinationals. He, he said that I met him when I was working in multinational and I, joined, I took a plunge and wanted, I started doing that on the side. And he said, look, if you're gonna work with banks, telecoms and whatnot, you can't use your name. You need to have a registered company. You need to have your taxes. You need to have so many things in place. So to do that, definitely we, we saw the importance of working um, using a limited liability company for that aspect. So why should people register? If you want your business to be seen as a serious entity, especially with um, top guns in the industry, you wanna register that too. From a financial perspective, I also began to see the correlation and the importance of having separate accounts for your business. The tendency, like Aunt Funke said, um, especially with the non-professionals is, is me, myself and I, let me just pay me and I'll, don't worry, I'll mix the money for Amala, together with the money for fill, for generator, together with the money for, you know, your business transactions. and. It, as part of being serious, even to yourself, is knowing at the end of a period, you know, that this is what we have made and this is what we have spent. And at the end of the day, this is what is left over for profit sharing and whatnot. So when you when you are using, um, using your personal account or not wanting to register your business, you begin to have some of these conflicts. This is not to say that if you have those structures, you cannot abuse it. But I mean, it's a step in the right direction when we start to do, the, uh, do this. So... Um, I think those were the key things for us when we decided to set up these secondary businesses. And um, I think I've also explained that from a regulatory point of view, I remember when um, Kola Komalidan Company was set up by my father. Um, he's also an ancestor of Yanvala. 
And he said at the time when they were registering, it was mandatory for them to, as part of the requirement for being discharged from their institution, to register a company in their name. And that, has what we, that is what we have been using for so long, but we're in the process of actually migrating into a partnership officially. Thank you so very much, Ms. Toludi Maokoji. Viewers, one resounding thing I must emphasize from what she has said is that to, to ensure the success of your enterprise, consult your lawyers. Now I'm emphasizing this not because, not just because I'm a lawyer who has to live in, but it's very apt and important for business success and life. Thank you so much, Toludi Maokoji. We'll move on to to Mr. Olufemi Akintunbe. Sorry, the Yoruba names are quite difficult to pronounce, but I'm trying my best. So, so kindly expound on the nature of your own business and if, how and if, if it affected your choice of corporate personality, how, or your business format. Please help us, thank you. Yeah, good morning, uh, fellow panelists and um, the participants on this program. Uh, I'd like to stand on existing protocol. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Noli, uh, who happens to be my professional colleague. We're all engineers together. One of the very few vibrant engineers in our group that time, not just that we work for the same company, we worked in the same team a very small team of less than 10. So you can see how intense that kind of uh, collaboration and teamwork could be, both in Nigeria and also in London, we were together. Uh, so Noli is a well-respected uh, shell engineer. Uh, beyond Noli, uh, we have a family tie as well. Uh, my wife, Noli, Daffy, all of us, we are very, very close. And um, yeah, we are talking about him today. Of a very, very fantastic uh, person. And uh, I must also say that Emma may not know how much we know her. Anybody who knows Daffy would know how close Emma was uh, to him. Daffy would uh, brag about the day Emma got admission to Oxford, the whole world knew about it. <laughs> and we all celebrated you in your absence. <laughs> So congratulations for how far you have been able to uh, carry the thing forward. And uh, I'm sure uh, wherever, wherever that is today, you'll be very proud of you and happy. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, Unali has um, said that what she wants us to achieve is to share real life experience and uh, cut through the crap um, to let people understand what it takes to run a business in Nigeria and how the setup goes. I have a slightly uh, different unique experience from uh, uh, my uh, fellow uh, panelists, uh, Mrs. Agbo uh, and uh, Tolu, um, in the sense that I started my career uh, from multinational uh, company, uh, that's Nestle, and where I did five, the first five years of my career. And then I joined Shell where I did another 12 years before deciding to step aside. Uh, like Unali said, some of us um, really, really were just so restless. Um, uh, while I was working for Shell, I didn't intend to even stay 10 years in Shell, uh, planned five years, but it became 10 years and 12 years. Uh, just because I, I already had a plan of what I wanted to achieve in life. And it wasn't my intention to work for so long in a corporate environment. As we all know, Shell happens to be one of the best employers, not in Nigeria, no, in the world. Uh, well paid, everything you are pampered, uh, particularly if you have a very thriving career, uh, which some of us were fortunate to do. So when you decide to say you want to resign from Shell, it's like a witch is chasing you from your village because that's where everybody wants to go to. Uh, I remember the HR director said, Femi, why are you leaving Shell? Shell leave people, people don't leave Shell. I'm surprised as they say you are resigning. I said, no, I'm resigning, I'm going. So where? So we had that long conversation uh, and um, it was clear to me what I was going to do. Uh, I needed to put this in perspective because I could see the demography of a lot of people on the 
call today, that some of you may be at that kind of transition point. Um, uh, and um, it, it's important for us to really lay that background. Um, but I won't dwell so much in that transition journey today. I will talk straight to the business, how I chose the business I run, uh, and how the structure that we have has influenced um, our key decisions and where we are today. We um, started as a facilities management company, which is real estate management. Um, later, we, uh, we, we did some form of backward integration into development, real estate development, um, where we now have a full complement of the uh, key uh, disciplines and uh, professions in the industry. From, we do from conceptual design of real estate planning. Um, we have all these various engineers you can talk about. We have quantity surveyors, we have lawyers, we have accountants, we have every single profession that can make real estate work. Um, staff strength started from about four. Today we are you know, over a thousand in Nigeria and outside Nigeria, uh, operating in about eight other African countries uh, outside Nigeria. Uh, so that's real estate development and management, our first line of business. We also diversified into the healthcare management about four years ago, where we provide um, diagnostic services. Um, we are currently running the diagnostic, uh, the diagnostic uh, department of Luth, uh, where we invested about 1.5 billion about three years ago, uh, running all sort of uh, diagnostic services for them. Um, because uh, they say that uh, health issue that is well diagnosed is more than 50% solved. Part of the problems we have in Nigeria is that doctors don't have the right tools to work with. And uh, it's one of the reasons why most of them are leaving the country. So that's about the, the company, about um, the aspirations that led to the formation of the company, how uh, did I choose that line and how did it um, get into a structure that we have? One of the things you need to understand is that before you go into any business, there are three important things. For those of you that are very book, uh, good to great, like Jim Collins, um, these three important things for me added together to form the company. Number one is that it must be a field where you have passion. You must have passion for whatever you want to do in terms of setting up a business. Um, from the one I knew I would never make a good medical doctor, despite all the pressure my parents put on me uh, to be a doctor, uh, because I did well in all the biological subjects, chemistry, maths, physics, everything, but I said, look, I can't be a doctor. Um, can I be a good lawyer? There would, there's no way. I'll be the worst lawyer anybody can hire. I can't argue to save my life when it comes to, to law. And the reason is very simple. I, I, I've never read a poem in my life and understood what they say. It looks like Greek to me. So uh, when it comes to uh, issue of law practice, everything, I defer to authority. Um, so passion is number one. Number two is that it has to be a field where you have um, skill. You, you, you must understand it very well because if you have passion for it, but you are not skillful in it, you'll be working for others. So you're going to have, a, I mean, have a big problem. So for you, your skill is very, very important. So, and I made sure that wherever I'm going into, as I was leaving Shell, it has to be a field that I will be very skillful. Uh, as an engineer, I know that was gonna be play to my strength. And of course the third one, it's not enough for you to have passion in something. It's not enough for you to be skillful in it. You need to assess the economic engine, economic power of it. If it doesn't make you money, then there's a problem because you need money to survive. So you are not just looking at a vocation or a hobby. You're looking for something that you're going to live on. So these three things put together helped in shaping the company called Alphamid in the real estate uh, industry. Now, for me, um, if you look at how you assess the economic engine uh, effectiveness of any business, you start yourself as an individual where you are an employee for an organization and you earn your salary. 
The next thing is you migrate further where you earn your salary, but you're also investing where you're running a business. And I would say that is the stage where I am now. I, 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 own, the, I own part of the business and I also uh, am, I'm an employee on another side. And thirdly is where you pull out and your asset begins to work for you. While you are sleeping, you are making money, whether you are there or you are not there. And what are these assets? It could be real estate, it could be your money where you invest into shares or anything, and that is making money for you. Different sort of structure. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. But please also help us um, elucidate the structure of our family as, a, as a, an institution or an organization. What is it? Is it a partnership company? Is it a, 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 a limited partnership? What exactly does it run as? Okay. Yeah. Um, so from the time I'm in, from the background I gave you that, I mean, I came from a multinational background. As we were trying to set up our farm it, um, it wasn't initially very, very clear. Uh, and I will very, I'll be very honest with you. But what I remember I did was that I prepared an info memo because everything starts from one person and sent out to over 150 people to invite them to come and invest with me. Uh, you'll be shocked that despite everything that people would say, oh, we love you, we do this. Listen, when it comes to decision about money and investment, you must recognize that you are number one on the forefront. I got less than five responses back out of 150. Friends, family, everybody you can think about. So from the five responses, only one person was ready to take the next step as to putting money down and putting his own personal resources down. So we started as two. But I also didn't want a one-man business or a partnership business because I didn't have the experience. And I know that partnership business in Nigeria could be a very difficult one. Before I left Shell, I invested a lot of partnership, put money there. The money never came back. Both the return on investment and the return of investment, I lost everything. So I made up my mind, it's going to be a properly constituted company. So we started and we registered the business as a limited liability company from the beginning. Then Thank you. we got a board of directors in place. We got some other investors later that joined. But let me quickly put one or two things in context for you. Despite the fact that I was the one that initiated everything, I needed to build confidence in others. And I made it clear to them that there's nothing called sweat equity. All of us are going to put money down to start this company. And I will be on salary like every, like every employee. So I, we agreed my salary, we negotiated, and I was on salary. But I also brought money in to own shares in the company because I could have stood out as an investor and not be part of the business or be an employee and not an investor. So I put money down as an investor and I'm also an employee. And that is still the status that we have today with a board of seven people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Akintunde. It is very clear from everything you've mentioned that you run a company, Affirmate is a company, limited liability company. And some factors you mentioned that must be considered in setting up the organization or an organization is passion. Uh, we thank you for not becoming a doctor and for not uh, being the reason a lot of patients are dead. <laughs> and then skill and of course, economic power. Thank you so much. And then I will now go over to my Oga at the top the managing partner of Compost Mentis Lego Practitioners, dynamic and delectable managing partner. So please, managing partner, I'm going to pay you with the Leonard Silk because of course you both should have the same time. How do you have the Leonard Silk? In what ways will you say that your corporate identity of your institution or organization is Thank you. Thank you so much, Duke. And I would also like to extend my deep gratitude to the panelists who have taken out time from their busy schedules to be here today. Thank you so much for being here. 
So um, as Lena Silk mentioned, the legal practice is very, can be very archaic and, you know, they can be dinosaurs and it's not just based on age, but based on just how we do our practice. So a lot hasn't changed, right? Um, as the CEO mentioned in our introduction, we're briefly a partnership for about two years before our founding partner you know, left the air to greater glory. And currently we are a sole proprietorship. So the major difference between you know, ACAS and Compost Mentis legal practitioners would be that Compost Mentis is a sole proprietorship and ACAS is a partnership, which means that for Compost Mentis, we would not have a partnership agreement, which would talk about um, donating profits and risk sharing, management role, voting criteria for different types of decisions, and those kind of similar issues are not within Compost Mentis. However, a major similarity is when she talks about the owners of the business being personally responsible for the debts and liabilities of the business. So importantly, let's think of this practically. When you sign an agreement with a sole proprietorship or a partnership, you don't sign with Compost Mentis legal practitioners. You sign with Emma Kinyovo acting for and on behalf of Compost Mentis legal practitioners because in law, the juristic person isn't the firm but the individual behind the firm. So that's where the difference will come between you know, this kind of entity and companies. Now, interestingly, because of the passing of the new Company and Allied Matters Act in 2020, there are new options that are available for law firms going forward into the future. We have something called limited partnerships now. We have limited liability partnerships, which are a very interesting hybrid between partnerships and companies. So you get the limited liability status of a company, but you still act as a partnership. You're still together sharing profit and you are taxed as partners and not companies. Of course, we know that companies have to pay corporation tax, which is different from what tax you pay either as workers in the company or either as you know, even shareholders when you pay dividends. But in a partnership, in a limited liability partnership, although you get the status of limited liability, you still get taxed at the partner level. So that's where, you know, that's the future, I think, of legal practice in Nigeria and where many firms will gravitate towards in the future because we won't have this problem that, oh, if something goes wrong, then you can come and carry my house, my car because of that personal, you know, liability to, to the business. So I think that's the future. Um, limited partnership, I don't think may take up as much in our profession because what that does is that it makes some people not liable for the debts, whereas the general partners will fully be liable like a traditional partnership or sole proprietorship. So again, I thought it was very important to bring up, you know, what the future is, even though um, Mrs. Agba and I aren't, aren't in any of those structures yet, but those are the structures we should be looking forward to in the future. Thank you so much, Mary. That was inspirational. Now, uh, also, I was look at the technological industry. Now, the industry seems like a new focus for most young entrepreneurs. What, in your opinion, would be a good business fit for an intending tech startup with limited financial muscle? A lot of people out there with burning desire to break limits, but then there is not just enough for them to put up to be on the ground to break those limits. Your opinion and possibly your advice to them. Okay, um, thank you for that, Duke. So I would say it really depends on the nature of your startup company. I know you mentioned limited finances, but an interesting part of technology now is fintech companies, right? These are, those are coming up and they are their nascent part you know, in this country. And for those kind of companies, you would definitely have to register as a limited liability company. And they also have minimum share requirements as mandated by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Because once you're doing anything in the financial sector, even if it's technology, you're going to be regulated by the Central Bank of Nigeria. So that's an important factor for anybody you know, looking to go into fintech to consider. Now, importantly, again, most tech companies will be seeking for seed money or they're looking for investors to grow their business because the partners or people coming together to form the company can't raise enough capital individually. Now, if you're running a technology business as a partnership, it may be more difficult for you to get investors on board because one, Equity investors will then become partners 
and they wouldn't want to be personally liable, as we mentioned, for the debts and liabilities of the company. So they don't want that. And then if they join as partners, that means the founding partners will have to give up some equity and they will possibly have to make significant changes to their partnership agreement. So that could just be a very long and cumbersome process. So, I mean, the easiest advice would be to say, set up a private limited liability company. You know, you form it with some sort of minimum share capital, maybe 1 million or less. The current minimum on CAC, I believe is 100,000 um, 100, Naira. So between that and a million. Again, as I said earlier, you need to be careful. It depends on the industry. You have to ask yourself the question, is it a regulated industry which requires a higher minimum share capital? And as you mentioned earlier, Duke, this is why it's important to engage a lawyer at the onset. Because you're a tech person, right? Your focus is on your product, your focus is on your service. You shouldn't get bogged down by legal issues of share capital or how do we incorporate a company at CAC. You know, you may argue, or people may argue in the tech sector that, oh, funds are limited and, you know, we don't really want to engage a lawyer. We can't just do it ourselves. I think that would be a very foolish move to take because the repercussions may be dire. You may spend more time, more energy on something you do not really understand. And as we all know, time is really money, right? We always discount that factor when we're thinking about it, but your time is money. Time that you could, you could spend developing your product, making a better product to market. You're spending it dealing with co corporate affairs commission, sending you different queries that are you, your company, where's the director, all those kind of things. There's no need for that. Now, if you do have a friend or a colleague that you have as a trusted lawyer, you could even reach, you know, there are different deals you can reach with these things. You could say to yourself, okay, um, we'll give you some shares in the company and we will make you a director so we can get some discounts on your services, you know, on your legal services. That's the way to go about it. And there are many firms, in, including Composmentis, which have lower fee options for startup companies. And this could also be a great advantage to tech companies. So I would say, you know, importantly, engage the lawyer. I think uh, Mrs. Tolu Dima Okoje spoke about when she was even starting up her side business, she spoke to a lawyer. It's so important. People always discount that uh, fact. If you don't speak at the beginning, you speak to the lawyer at the stage. You have to choose. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry to have to have, uh, have asked you that question that made you public advice. But then that's not responsibility in a leader. I will thank you for that. Now we'll go back to the dinosaur in the room. Ma Leonard Silk, please be free. For persons who may be interested in adopting or following the same directions you have put in the form of a firm, what would be the salient or most important factors for persons to take note of in bullet points? What are those things we the young man. I want to have a um, gray hairs on your head, man. so I won't have one. I want to be like like you, man. So in setting up what you have now, what are those salient points that uh, we must take note of? What are those factors we must consider to have something that you have? Thank you so much. All right. Um, a lot has been said. Sorry, ma. sorry ma. Before you start, yeah, you should be dropped in the, in the comment section. We are nearing the end of the program. We are about to take questions and ask you. Sorry, Leonard. All right, thank you very much. A lot has been said, and I have learned a lot just listening to all of this. Um, um, I just want to speak to question. Um, law practice is a business. Um, Mrs. Akpede, when she made the introduction, introduced me as a lawyer. Um, and also a businesswoman. When I started practice as a lawyer, it never occurred to me that I was a businesswoman when I entered into the partnership. But, but I am, because law is today, it's a business. And just as Mr. Latunde Akintude had mentioned about a business, because I, I think it's key that people understand um, what it means to do that. He talked about what he knew what he wanted to do and he knew that he had to have a certain skill set and that's really what it's all about knowledge the skills and how do you get those skills 
and of, obviously passion, but you can't eat passion. Passion has to be followed by action. So you can be passionate, people can talk, they can be passionate about some, a lot of things, but they don't really do anything about it. But if you are truly passionate about something, you will get up and do something about it. You do that by investing in yourself. If you don't even know enough, you will build the knowledge you have to invest in yourself. Even if you're working in a, an organization, in a multinational or whatever, or on an organization where you are an employee, you be investing in yourself and you even stand out when people see that you're doing more than they expect you to do. That's how you stand out. And that's how even people pull you out and say, oh, come and join this team. And then you get further and further and you get more recognition. And if you are somebody like that, you have the drive. So in bringing, doing a business, and obviously you can't do it by yourself. Ms. Akinta just said that the same thing. So you need to bring people who have the skills. And I find that people, because I'm a lawyer, so we're involved, involved in helping businesses, their business, we restructure the, their businesses, their employees come, and go, we help them um, prepare the um, documents for engagements or, you know, actually or exiting and all of that. So like in any business, you're going to start. For, especially for us, when we're dealing with international people, they're coming into the country, the first people they talk to are their lawyers and their accountants. They're talking about establishment, doing things within the law, making sure that you are properly, whatever it is, you're you are doing something, you're in compliance, you're doing what the regulator expects you to do. And obviously the taxes, because the government is going to come after you. So you need your lawyer and you need your accountant. But you need talent. If you want to build a business, that is going to go forward and you're going to leave behind. And this is a business where at the end of the day, you have grown it so well that it's become an asset. You are sleeping and you are making money. That is, that is the be all and end all of what it is you want to achieve. And it is that that propels you forward and makes sure that you know, your entrepreneurial skills or your business skills are not in vain. And so in doing so, to, to do so, you just need to have talent. I find that people are really very, very key. If you have the right people around you, do well. It's better you even have people who are better than you. People should not be afraid to employ, because I find sometimes people are afraid to employ people who are better than them. But you, you have to employ people who are younger than you. You have to people who, have, who, are, who are innovative who are creative, if you don't have that skill set, you need to buy that skill set and bring it into your business. Offer them an interest in it because that way people knowing that they're working for themselves will do even better for you. So for us as a law firm, um, Duke was asking about if people wanted to set up a long firm, I think that's what you're asking. What would you do and all of that? It's all about skills, all about talent, bringing the right people together, have a good, you know, be aligned, the leadership of the organization, the leadership of the partnership, all of you should be aligned in your views as to what you want to do. And you bring the people along with you. And you need to have people who are going to make partners in your pipeline. You have to begin to identify them early on. You need to identify them early on and you need to hint to them about that possibility. Don't identify them and don't tell them because they're going to go. So you need to identify them, you need to tell them, you need to encourage them, you need to show, for, for, for law firms in particular, you need to show them what your partnership track is so that they know that they're going along the right way. Evaluations are important. So those are the sort of things that I think, communication is very, very key. Young people want to hear, they want to know, are they doing the right thing? Are they going the right way? And one thing I always tell young, younger people, you have to have a mentor. Your mentor does not need to know that he's your mentor. You need to be, follow people. You need to understand what it is, how that person, the person you're looking up to, how did they get there? They didn't get there by sleeping, and sleeping in their house every day or waiting for somebody to call them to do something. You need to have a mentor. You need to have people that you're looking up to. You need to. And I tell mentors, other people, people who are already on their way to look back and pick up mentees along the way. There are some people who don't even know that they are good, but you are the one that will show them that this is the way to go. 
direct them. Look out for people, look out to help people. It's very, very important, especially in this society today. People, a lot of people have lost their way. There are people that can find their way back because you paid attention to them. So we need to keep our eyes open all the time. It is something I'm very, very passionate about. I speak about it all the time. So these are the sorts of things that you know work in my Thank mind you. are what, what are really important. Thank you so much, Leonard Silk. You've blessed me especially. I really, really thank you for that. And now we go over to the question and answer session because of time. And the first question I will direct to the managing partner of Compost Mentis. Please adhere classes of businesses that must be registered in a specified form. This question was asked by one BJM or Joe. So can you do just a few minutes to the question? Um, okay. I think maybe what the question meant, if there are certain sectors that are setting business forms, I, I, I think that's what the question meant. And I think uh, Leonard Silk and Tolu have spoken a lot of certain uh, businesses that must be registered in a particular way. For instance, law firms cannot be incorporated as companies, right? So it has so um, proprietorships or were partnerships. That's just the regulation in that particular industry. Similarly, for accountants, for real estate firms, those industries have their specific regulations. Now, for other businesses, there might not be regulation in terms of the type of business you want to register. But as I mentioned, say you are you're regulated by Central Bank of Nigeria. The Central Bank of Nigeria will say, no, you have to be a company and you have to be registered with minimum share capital of 20 million, for instance, if you're a finance company, or you need to register with so this month, 3 billion, if you're this kind of bank. So for those sectors that have a regulatory body, either a government regulatory body, or like the law profession, which is regulated, we, we internally regulate ourselves, you may be limited by the structures that you can come up with. Of course, if you're in another sector, for instance, if you're in, um, I don't know, agriculture or some other sector that don't have those certain requirements, then you can decide what you want to do. You can decide I'm doing it by myself. I have a farm. I'm going to farm my goods and sell it to market, or I want to become a company or a partnership. So it really depends on the sector. That's why I said engage a lawyer. When you engage a lawyer and you tell them what your business is, they can do that research and decide for you which particular um, business format would be best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Managing Partner, for your answer. And this one will be directed to, to Leonard Silk, and it affects the legal profession. Mm -hmm. Considering the RPC, you know, the RPC has persons who are non-lawyers from investing in a law practice. So a lawyer must not share profit with a non-lawyer. Now, you also mentioned here that the law firm is a business and should be seen in the light of a business. So given the business idea of a law firm, is there a on that point still okay? Should it be sustained? Does it meet the need of the business idea of a law firm? Or do you think it should be changed to allow investors? Because outside Nigeria, you have firms that employ close to 1,000 lawyers. You don't have such in Nigeria because lawyer man, they put together what they have, which a lot of times may not be big enough to sustain the kind of business idea they have. So do you think it should be modified, changed, expunged, or retained? Thank you. Well, I, I can't say expunge or exchange or anything, but um, the law, 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 the law, the law, law profession. So um, a lot of, of what we do, it's a very old profession and um, lawyers are generally quite um, fixed or sometimes, you know, very traditional in their ways. So it's possible that over time this might change, very, very possible, um, but whether it is going to change um, soon, I cannot tell. However, um, it does not stop the fact that you don't have non-lawyers invest in a law firm does not mean that a law firm cannot grow. You know, law, law firms make 
very, make a very, very good living. And uh, the fact that we don't have law firms of a thousand lawyers in Nigeria right now, the government is not possible. It's very possible because there was a time when we only had one man law firms. Now we have law firms with up to 150 lawyers in Nigeria as we speak. So especially particularly in Lagos, that's the beginning of a new direction in, in, in the practice country. Nigeria is a huge country. There's a lot that we can do and um, there's opportunity for growth. Um, it is very likely that this might change sometime in the future, but certainly not now, but I don't think it hinders the growth of law firms as a business venture at all. I think that um, it Thank doesn't inhibit it in any way. Because even now you have law Thank firms you. that do other things other than law, they do um, company sectorial work, which is not necessarily law because you have people who do company sectorial work who are not legal practitioners. So um, that sort of thing. So that's, uh, I don't Thank think you it's so inhibited. Much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dennis. That's the voice of hope. So we're hoping that um, it gets better. Thank you. And now to Jinma Okoje, please. You mentioned about uh, choice of businesses. You also mentioned about business registration. Now, can one's choice of business, the line he has chosen, can it affect the ease of raising funds for that business? Is there any way that is there any correlation between one's choice of business and the ease of raising capital for that business? Thank you. All right, very quickly. Thank you for that question. That's an excellent question. And I, I would say yes. Um, it, um, I was taking this question two dimensions. So from a loan, three dimensions, from a loan perspective, from an investor's perspective, and even from setup cost. So from a setup cost, the ease of raising funds to start that business, if you want to go into development, for example, you want to start building properties, then the um, raising the ease of raising funds for that would be quite different from if you want to start trading some um, you know sim simpler materials like maybe children's clothes and all of that. I mean, it's it's scalable that you can start with perhaps say fifty thousand or hundred thousand. You can move it up and down a bandwidth. But chances that you want to develop in real estate, for example, you're not likely to say you want to start developing properties with just 50,000 naira. Okay, again, if you want to do agriculture um, and you want to raise funds for that business, that line of business, you're looking at quite a lot of things, just not just the land, if you're lucky enough to even get the land free, maybe your family property. There's the cost of seeding, for fertilizing water, um, cost of labor before you actually get your harvest, okay? as opposed to, again, for example, professional services. So you graduate, and you graduate, for example, from school and some professions, you're able to start consulting right away for clients. I mean, as a lawyer, for example, you set up your business, you can actually, especially now with virtual offices, start working virtually and consult for clients. So you have a family friend who has a business, doesn't have a lawyer, you go meet out for them. So your overhead may not be as, as expensive to start that line of business because you can reach out to their office, have meetings in their office, that sort of thing. So I would say, yes, the um, choice of business line can affect the ease of raising funds from business. Again, from the point of view of loans, the type of business, there are some businesses that financial institutions are more interested in lending money to from a place of um, structure and also from a place of the ROI from that. And then there's also, like someone said earlier, um, I believe it was our, um, it was Emma that said that something about investors, because for example, if you're a sole proprietor or your partner, it can be a cause of concern, like how is this going to work? So I think those are the three, three dynamics to that question and I hope I've done justice to it. You have, you have, and thank you so much for that. Thank you. Now there's a question which I think will be redirected I think this, uh, the, the, the owner of this question should um, do take the, the, the formal procedures of consulting a law firm. The question is, as a young person who owns a laundry business, what business structure is suitable for me to register my business? Is it PLC, LTD, or LLP? So uh, I don't know who the, who, the, who the owner of the question is who asked the question, but I think um, 
you should take steps to consult a law firm and have them advise you on what is suitable because there are more. Uh, you can't get enough of what would be suitable for you to make an informed decision just here because we don't have time for all that. So please, to consult a firm and they will definitely guide you on what to do. Okay, do you can go to 12.05. We have some question from Bidemi Ojo at 12.05. Okay, okay, okay. It's asking Excuse to into the five that when when you have a passion in two different fields with skill sets to meet both talents, how do you decide what to go into? And then another one to Mr. Akin today again, he says, could you share what your debt equity ratio is? And how that has helped to optimize profits as a limited liability company. So I think, I think Mr. Peter, you take the first. Yeah. Um, let me speak to the first one. On uh, you have two key areas where you have passion and you have skill, and you are saying which one do you do? Uh, what will determine what you do could be the degree of your passion in one. Uh, if it's very, very strong and it's stronger than the other, that may give you an immediate um, advantage. The second one is the competitive landscape. Sometimes you have passion, you have skill in an area, but the competition there is very, very tense. You will, be, you will do better for yourself to move more towards the blue ocean than the red ocean. Another thing that could guide you is um, the issue about uh, the third one. You have skill, you have passion, but one earns you less money. If uh, profitability is one of the reasons why you are going into the business and it's not an NGO. If it's an NGO, they look for other value that you have to serve. If it is serving people, and the more poor people you're able to attend to, then you use that one to swing the pendulum in the direction uh, that will favor you. So I think if you look at those factors, the other one is the cost of setting up. Uh, you may have passion, skill, and it gives you money, but if the required entry barrier is very high for one, and you know you cannot start it very well uh, initially, you, that may also tell you which one you should start first. And there's nothing that says you cannot do the two. It may just be a factor of sequencing. You start with one, and then you use one to leverage your opportunity to take on the second one, and you can still do the two. That's what they call serial entrepreneurship. So I hope that answers the first question. On the second question, yeah. on the second question of um, debt equity uh, ratio as a strategy for uh, leveraging profitability. I think I need to make it very, very clear. And this is the mistake a lot of people make uh, in business. Your source of funding is more than just debt and equity. There are other ways of you being able to raise money to do your business, particularly aspect of working capital. Um, if it is an, a business that require a high uh, level of capital or equipment or asset, you can actually go for some form of leasing, which is indirectly a debt, but it's a debt that is tied to asset specifically. You also have the opportunity of that line of business being able to do what you call uh, off plan, like in real estate, where you can leverage customer um, funding to write uh, the, to write the, the wind to, for, for you to get your business started, you can use part of the customer money to prepare you. Let's say you want to buy something, you can get some prepayment from the customer to do it. Another one is your profit retained earning. So when you run a business, you don't spend all your money as you earn it, living from hand to mouth. So one of the strategic ways to look at is also to raise money through your retained earning. That's your own fund. And then, of course, the equity and then the bank loan. Now, talking about the debt.
Mr. Oluthemi, we can't hear you. I think you are muted. I think you mute yourself. Thank I, you. I, yeah, I don't know how that happened. Okay. So I was trying to talk about, I've explained the various sources through which you can improve your position, your, your funding position, without necessarily looking at just debt and equity directly, because there are other ways. Now, on the debt equity, which is what we call gearing in business, when you have a gate in a high interest environment, you'll be working for the bank, okay? You just discover that you are making 100, 900% and 70% you're using it to pay bank loan. When that happens in a high interest environment like Nigeria, where we are paying as much interest as 22, 25, at a point we were paying like that, so we will give you the interest rate, give you processing fee, facilitation fee, management fee. By the time you add it together, it's about 30 something percent. How many businesses do you do in this country that you make 30% profit? So what it means is that banks are making more money than you or your shareholders as owners of the business. What that tells you automatically is that you have a get for that environment, all right? Where the interest you are paying is more than the profit you are retaining in the business, that's over gearing. There are environments where the interest rate is lower. Like in Europe, most in the UK, for instance, you're talking of, 3%, 4% interest from bank. When you do a business there and you make 10, 15% net profit, you are doing very well because by the time you take the 3% out, you still have something to share amongst your shareholders. So I won't say that there is any particular formula. It depends on the industry, the type of business and the type of environment in which you find yourself. As you know, Alpha Mid is diversified. So I don't know which part of my business you want me to tell you the gearing ratio. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, then let's have a different conversation uh, outside this forum. Thank you. Uh, I, think that, I think that solves it. Thank you so much, Mr. Olufemi Akintundi. And because of time, we'll not be taking all your questions, dear viewers, and we're very, very sorry, deeply sorry for that. However, if you could direct your questions to come to the that was we could, we could um, help out and provide solutions to your problems. And the last question, the last question, I will direct it to the managing partner of Campus Mentis Legal Practitioners to say the last part. And the question is this, that academic institutions in Nigeria, a lot of academic institutions in Nigeria are registered as uh, incorporated trustees, but huge academic fees, which are related to a service in life of businesses. So would it be legal for academic institutions? Would it be the best fit? Or are there other options they could use to make them more legal within the bounds of Thank you. Thank you, Duke. And I'm really happy that we got to this question about talking about incorporated trustees, because we haven't spoken about not-for-profit not organizations and charities and things like that. So. The reason why some academic institutions choose to register as incorporated trustees is because there are benefits to that registration, right? So for instance, the government gives you tax benefits. As an incorporated trustee, you're seen as, okay, you're not making profit to share among your owners, your shareholders, or your partners. So the government gives, makes those profits tax exempt. And that's why you find some institutions wanting to register as incorporated trustees. But now you have to be careful because incorporated trustees have their own special fiduciary duties. They are seen as you're coming together either because you have a social cause or you have something bonding you together, either a club like, for instance, a Koei club, or you're a church, or you're a mosque, or you know, different sorts of you know, NGOs will also register under this, um, under this form of a business organization being an incorporated trustee. Now, to the question that says, you know, academic institutions, they are charging very high fees and they are still being able to, you know, they're still able to keep this their state of incorporated trustees. I think the important distinction to make is that charging a fee for a service is very different from what an organization does with the money and for the service. So please, let's keep that distinction in mind. The charging of fee different from what you as the organization does with that fee. 
So yes, you even have several churches that own academic institutions and they charge quite high fees, arguably to deliver better quality education. Now, if the money that is earned for those, from those fees are actually re-employed into the academic institution, such as you know, building libraries, giving scholarship to disadvantaged students, or maybe paying of salaries for lecturers, then it might not be profit, it might not be a profit-making venture, strictly speaking, because the profit is not being shared to members of that association. I think where the things where the issues become dicey is where you have trustees that are being paid exorbitant salaries for services rendered to the institution. There are many that will argue that this is just tantamount to profit sharing. And if you look at the current um, Company and Allied Matters Act, you will see that there's a power that CAC has under, I think it's section 389 of CAMA. CAC has a power to remove trustees and replace them or suspend trustees for many issues. Fraud is one of the issues that you're you know, misusing the property of the, of the, of the association, that you're, you've acted in a, you know, with misconduct. Mis you know, those are issues that CAC can take up get, you know, with the approval of the Minister of Trade, they can get a court order to remove, to suspend, to replace trustees. So even though you are registering as a trustee, as an incorporated trustee, you have to be careful because there is extra obligation on you. So don't think you can register as an incorporated trustee and use it as a sham to just be collecting profit for yourselves and your family members without paying taxes. That may not no longer apply because of this extra burden on you. So I think that distinction is clear. And this is why Academic institutions that charge high fees and still be registered as incorporated trustees. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, the, the, the clear distinction is it's different to charge for your services and not entirely to share profit with the organization. Thank you for that. We just hope not share profit. We just hope not share profit. And I want to hand over to the CEO of Compost, Chief Officer 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 of Compost, logged in to join the conversation, ask questions. If there's anything else that is still burning in your minds that you want clarification on, either from the panelists or from Compost Mentis, please uh, send a message to info at compost-mentis.com or you can chat with us on our website at www.compost-mentis.com. And if you see the flyer up, we have up now, we're actually hiring. We're looking for new uh, council for compost mentis in all three locations. We have offices in Lagos, Abuja, and uh, Wari. So we're looking for lawyers to join the firm in those three locations. If you're interested or you have, you have no friends or family that are looking for jobs, they can go online to our website to get um, more information and they can send them a line CV or the, and their credentials to the legal chambers at gmail.com. So we've learned a lot today. We've learned that you have to have passion for your business before you go into any business. You need to collaborate or set up the business with people of like mind, people that have shared the same kind of vision as you. Before you do anything, they've said it a million times, yeah, please consult a lawyer <laughs> before you go too far. And we've come to understand that businesses are constantly evolving. See the way Femi has moved the business of um, Alpha Mead from just a small company to a, a group. And the way even the Denton's Akas law, it wasn't Denton's until about, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago, Auntie Funke, you know, where they- just, No, uh, just uh, April, just this year. Wow. So that Collabo yeah. Alliance has, uh, you know, broadened- it's Just you. Yeah, yeah. Broad, broadened substantially the kind of outreach that Akas law has, you know. And you can see that, I mean, now that our dear to Lou is in charge of her dad's business, things are really going to be changing, I'm sure. It will no longer be one Nigerian firm now. Tomorrow it will be West Africa, next day it will be Africa and to be the world. So really, there's constant evolution of businesses and it, that change is a constant. And if you, stay stag if, you, if you don't change, you will stagnate and you become irrelevant and your business will die. There are professional regulatory bodies for most of these kind of um, sectors we're going into. So let us be mindful of what the regulations are. And if you're in doubt, 
In fact, before you start, consult a lawyer. Thank you so much for joining us at this webinar. This is a monthly, we have a monthly webinar series going on this year. I don't know what the managing partner is planning for next month, but I'm sure it will be some topical issue and there'll be very brilliant panelists as well. So please watch out, go to our website, join us on our social media handles, and there's never a dull moment in Compass Plenty's Legal Practitioners. Thank you so much for joining us. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.